John, what's up, buddy? Um, I know we're uh, really good friends. It's been a little while, so um, I'm glad yeah, that man. I was able to I was able to get you on. Um, I know you're abroad, and we'll talk about that a little bit. But um, before we really get into the nuts and bolts of what your uh, ultimate business is right now, can you tell us a little bit about yourself and you know who John is? <laughs> yeah. So um, right now, I'm a little bit of a nomad entrepreneur, uh, as I guess what I'm identifying with right now. <laughs> I, um, when I was 18, 19 year old, 19 years old, I joined the Marine Corps. Um, I went the like recon, uh, scout sniper route. And I think that shapes like a lot of, a lot of who I am, uh, now. And towards the end of that, uh, being deployed, I was able to save some money. And so, um, with that, I started learning about investing. I found bigger pockets and, uh, and, and then found out what real estate wholesaling is started that towards my the tail end of my career and um that really introduced me to where i'm at now which is uh you know running a a full-time real estate wholesaling business um and then i'm also i'm also an investor i have uh, i think 86 stores right now um and i don't know if we've talked about the the hotel that i own as well um so um if you want to dive into that uh, i own real estate and i actually sold all my real estate in california so i do own real estate in the midwest uh, all, all of it's in Missouri. I kind of just decided to focus on that, making that my one thing. And, um, yeah, man, that's, that's, that's pretty much what John, who John Lalonde is in a nutshell. Well, cool. Yeah. I, um, I know we've talked about at least wholesaling side and then doing some flipping, but let's talk about active versus, you know, passive. And then we yeah. can go into the passive for sure. Cause I, I don't yeah. think we've dabbled conversation wise since I've, yeah. you know, since I've known you about your, um, you know, longer to- term holds. So mm-hmm. let's talk a little yeah, bit about the, the active stuff first, like, you know, wholesaling, yeah. how you guys get your leads, like what does that type of model look like? And what mm-hmm. is it, what's changed? Cause now we're, you of know, course. tail end of 2022. So I know a lot of stuff has changed, especially in real estate. Yeah, a lot has changed. Um, so we are doing pay-per-click advertising. Uh, we're doing, so Google ads, uh, we, we pay for leads, um, which is basically SEO companies. Um, that, that sell us leads. And then I have a team of cold callers and texters. So I do a little bit of everything, but you, you did mention, um, like what's changed. So in Southern California specifically, we have enough data to back that SMS and cold call. It just doesn't really work as well as it does in the Midwest. And so what we've decided is, and, and to get our, our off market leads, We've really focused on on paper lead and paper click where people are filling out our web form and reaching out to us. You know, it, it's just worked a lot better than the shotgun approach because there are so many houses in such a small area. For example, so, you know, Orange County, Los Angeles, there's so many houses to buy all that data and then text all of them versus the amount of people that are actually motivated to sell. You have a higher, it's, it's expensive to live in Southern California. So you do have different clientele. And so uh, we've just noticed better results and, and I'd be happy to dive into that even deeper. Um, but we do pay-per-click PPL in Southern California. And then in our other markets, we do a lot more SMS and cold calling, um, especially because landlines exist more in the Midwest and, and Louisiana. Hmm. Yeah. I mean, I think, uh, well, I kind of, this goes to the conversation of some coaches, you know, in real estate sales, let's mm-hmm. just talk about residential. They're like, Hey, cold call, cold call, cold call. And what I've experienced through not just my own experience, but other experience, because I've done cold calling, I've had people do cold calling is at least here in Southern California, it's met with a lot more, um, disdain versus, you know, a lot of people that I talk to in, you know, um, Nebraska or, mm-hmm. um, you know, Louisiana, um, or Texas, like those people are willing to have a conversation with you. If you just call them up and say, Hey, you know, this, or, you know, text back usually in Southern California, at least my experience, um, is it's not as well received. Yeah. And I think some of that is just, it's oversaturated with a bunch of people all going after the same sort of low hanging fruit, right? Because you have real estate agents that are, that are cold calling and huge brokerages that have a ton of money to hire cold callers um, that are terribly trained to be on just to be frank like they're yeah. I, I spend a lot of time 
uh, training my cold callers to sound different than the typical, like, you know, a terrible salesperson, I guess. And so um, I think they just get so used to that, that they do respond negatively. Uh, everyone's going after the same group of people. Yeah, no, everybody's, so these people are being bombarded. Um, doesn't right. matter if, you know, so you got to kind of be, I think out with the old of, you know, the industry thought process of, okay, well just call cancel their expires or call <laughs> probate or, yeah. you know, the, the things that are pretty, like you said, low hanging fruit to say, right. this is an easy takedown. Well, it's not so easy because everybody has the same lists. Mm -hmm. Um, Right. And and then it's a competitive market. Like you said, it's expensive. So people just got to They got to eat, too. Right. Right. Exactly. And then on, on top of that, like with the, the thing that most people in the industry lack is if you get a cold call and SMS lead, think about the chances of that be, person being motivated to sell at the moment you call them. It's it's very low. Right. Maybe they will be interested in selling at some point. But really, like that is just you have to look at those leads as just people that rose their hand and said i you know maybe at some point in the next few years i will sell that's just now your database and now you have to have a marketing plan for that database specifically you have to treat those leads like like data in itself so you need to you need to stay in front of them with your marketing with your email with your you need to continue cold calling them uh you can't just you know say oh those are leads let's have a call with them see if they're interested in selling it's a yes, they are a good lead or no, they are a bad lead. Whereas, you know, pay-per-click leads, um, someone that reached out to you, they typically like the pain, the pain, they had to fill out a web form online. The pain was there. They mm -hmm. felt the pain in order to do that. And so I think people look at the leads similar and they're not similar. They, they have different time horizons. Yeah. Um, have you, uh, we're, you know, we talked for a little while before we jumped on the call. Have you talked about or, you know, put into place or thought about putting into place radio ads? Is that something that, because I know there's some guys that, yeah, that do do, um, well, I mean, like there's a lot of Southern California based uh, wholesalers that do, you know, like sellers, sellers advantage and stuff like that. They'll do mm -hmm. um, a lot of radio ads and then they'll also do commercials, um, yeah. TV commercials. So have you dabbled in that or have you thought about doing that too, to add some, some other layer to getting more leads? Absolutely. So I've thought about it and, um, I do see it happening in the future. And the only, uh, the only thing that I'm looking at right now is I feel, I, I really do believe you have to have very good inbound, inbound customer service in order to do that. And sure. so because we pulled back on direct mail, we've basically stopped that. So we used to have an answering uh, our, our own um, basically answering service. And so they would do warm transfers directly to our lead managers. And we cut that out because we stopped doing mail. So I'd have to, I would have to open up that basic, like basically like that department again. And right now I'm, I'm more focused on um, tackling the database of people that I already have that rose their hands over the last two years and said that they would be interested in selling because with the way the market's heading, I do think that there's going to be a ton of opportunity in the database, just catching them at the right time. I'm hearing a lot more um, conversations right now about I need to sell because I've, I've got debt. And that was something that you didn't really hear last year uh, or oh, the yeah. year before that, right? It was like, I've got so much equity in the house. I just put a for sale sign in front of my house and I would have people banging at the door to try to get, you know, to try to get into it. Now you're hearing a little bit of a different story, which is I've got, um, you know, I have bills that I need to pay. And then when people get laid off, which is happening more and more every single month, mm -hmm. th then they're really in a bind. And that's where, you know, that's where our service actually helps people instead of just trying to convince people to sell at a discount. Right. For sure. Yeah. I mean, I think the pain points weren't as prevalent and that's why, you know, talking about doing, you know, advertising in bigger markets like uh, Orange County and also LA, I think that I've, I've had trouble before, especially when we jump on, before we jump on the call, I think that that was an issue because so many people had so much more money that was readily available the past two, two and a half years that they really, they're like, dude, I'm not selling for, you know, you know, uh, 60 cents on the dollar. It just doesn't right. make sense to me right now. I can hold out. Yeah. Now, now it's changing where it's like, I need that, you know, yeah. I need that amount. Yeah, no, absolutely. hundred percent seeing that. So for, um, what, it, I mean, when you're doing this database, uh, I would say crawl through making mm -hmm. sure you're hitting these, how much, how many people are in your database? 2000, 20,000, you know, how many people are in there? 
Yeah, so I have about uh, 350,000 records okay. um, of, of people that uh, w- would have some sort of either either motivation or, or just property records. And then out of that, um, about 2,000 of those people have already said that they are interested in selling um, okay. in, in some way. And so a lot of those, you know, the, the majority of them come from SMS. And um, that's just a, hey, have you ever considered selling your property on 123 Main Street? They'll, sure, if the offer is good enough, they'll make it into my CRM. Obviously, uh, all the way from there to a uh, pay-per-click exact phrase match lead, which are the best, uh, which is, you know, exact phrase match means they said something with the word fast or cash in it. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, there's typically those are those convert just a ton higher. Um, but about 2000, so I'm, I'm really looking at ways, uh, you know, to stay in front of all of those people. Um, I want them to see American home acquisitions consistently via yeah. text, via call. Oh, they got a piece of mail. Um, and I think that's the benefit of, of radio ads too. Is it gives you some credibility as well, right? Because you're on the radio. People think, oh, you have to be famous to be on the radio, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and so um, yeah. I think it does help. Yeah, I mean, I think uh, that's what helps people get over the hump if you have radio or you have, um, I mean, at least when um, I was doing a lot of it, it radio specifically not commercial ads but they you get that um kind of uh like um like you said yeah validation and reputation of okay well if i go up against you john and you know we're sitting in front of them or you know one of my um sales agents is sitting in front of them well they're going to go with me or they're going to go with you depending on how much uh, market you know, information and or share that you have versus me. And that could be because they, they heard you on the radio and they're like, this guy's all over the place. He's on the radio. He's, you know, texting me or, you know, I'm going to go with John because, you know, I heard him, I saw him on TV, but I haven't heard him anywhere else. And Peter right. wasn't on TV or radio. So, yeah, exactly. So, so yeah, you get that. Um, what do you see, you know, going forward for, for your business being able to, I know you kind of were, you're doing a lot more flips. Now you kind of transitioned a little bit. Um, yeah. What does it look like going forward in the next two years? Um, so I know we were talking earlier in the call and I, I think that what happens is a lot of people will look at the wholesaling and flipping business as, as sort of the same thing, mm-hmm. but they're very different. They're very different to scale. And I know since you've flipped, you've dealt with this. I think that the flipping business, I mean, you're looking at more of like, how do you manage that many projects at one time? And it's sure. a different business. And, and for me personally, uh, and some people will completely disagree with this and that's okay, but I think that it's a much harder business to scale. And so I think that looking at wholesaling as basically more of a marketing and sales business, and that's all it is, is you need to have, you know, sale, like front end sales and back end sales, people that can acquire houses and then sell houses. Mm-hmm. And, that's really all wholesaling is. It's it's much easier to scale. So, um, you know, I think this shift in the market was a little bit of a blessing for us. Um, and there are still properties that we have, especially like some of our luxury. I don't know if you know what's going on in Palm Springs uh, with the uh, Airbnb permits. Um, yeah, they they changed it right to like. Yeah. Um, what did they just change it to? Sorry to. Well, yeah, no, 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 no worries. We can, we can go into it, but, uh, we, you know, one of our, one of our flips, uh, was like kind of a luxury. It was, it was specifically like the only person that's going to buy that. It's, it's probably going to be somebody that wants to put it on Airbnb, $1.3 million, uh, kind of ARV. And, mm-hmm. uh, you know, as soon as the, as soon as the noise came out about the, the permits, um, the market activity really stopped. And so, um, I, in my business, I, you know, I run more of the sales department, KPIs, market, like real marketing, marketing sales. Mm-hmm. Um, so, so that part of it, uh, was taken care of by another partner. I wouldn't be able to give you the most accurate information other than, um, we're going to be able to reapply for permits. I guess we were grandfathered in from when we applied from the first place. Uh, but there are going to be limiting, like, I guess the amount of days per year that you can actually have your, your property rented on a, as a short term rental. Yeah, they used to be 32 days and it could be like, you know, 32 times, sorry, not 32 days. So 32 days throughout mm-hmm. the year, but it's yeah. such a big market to be able to, you know, stay for, you know, cause you got the, 
they call them snowbirds coming from, you know, Canada down there for a month. So you mm-hmm. could, you, you know, you could have three months of, you know, people there or four months of people there and count that towards, you know, the 32, but I think they chopped it in half or they did something to change it. Cause yeah. I got a client that has a place out there and he was doing great. I don't know what it's going to look like now for the change, but the same thing, I guess this goes to say like secondary markets are the ones that you really need to be cognizant about, especially yep. in market turns, because we had a flip in Joshua Tree that we barely broke even on because yep. they started raising the interest rates. We had to kind of pivot like when we were in the rehab phase because the contractor was like, let's, I mean, speaking to, you know, you and scaling and stuff like that, he was like, let's just wait for the uh, cabinets coming. I'm like, dude, they're going to come in in like a month. There's no way we don't have the time. Like, yeah. let's just get shaker, put them in and be done with it. Yeah. And if we didn't do that, we would have probably lost 50 to 60 grand. Yeah. And I think, and I think we're going to, we're going to lose on, on, uh, on this one. And it's pretty inevitable at this point, but that being said, to go back to your question, like, where do I see the next two years? I'd really want to double down on on the wholesaling and marketing um just because it's a it's a for me it's a business that i understand better and i know how to scale and so um to try to do all of those things 100 percent you can do it but it's a different business and so i'm no longer interested in doing in doing both um and you know last year it made a lot of sense because the properties were you could be a terrible flipper and you'd make money last year and a lot of people got a false sense of confidence last year mm-hmm. because yeah. They're like, oh, I'm a great flipper. I bought a property. I made forty thousand dollars. Yeah, the property appreciated sixty thousand dollars in the yeah. time that you <laughs> like you wouldn't have made any money in a normal market. Yeah. Um, much less where we're at now. So um, yeah, I would say uh, I I really love I really am passionate. Like I'm not I'm not. We were talking about you know exits and everything. I don't plan on exiting out of a wholesaling business anytime soon because I like to build. I love building it. And then mm-hmm. on top of that, uh, in the next two years, I'm going to continue using the off market opportunities to build my to build my uh, quote unquote passive income. Uh, although I don't believe anything's passive. <laughs> yeah. No, I mean, I even if you have to deal with a property manager that you put into place, like you still got to contact them. I mean, it may be three or four months. Uh, I mean, sorry, three or four um, hours a month, but yeah, you still got to kind of run your books, make sure you're having those conversations. Yeah, I don't think, um, you know, yeah. I don't think anything's ever really passive. And really, honestly, like, the people that I see that really want to be, you know, sit on the beach with their feet up, either get too bored or like, you know, they, I feel like they uh, age very quickly because they don't have anything that's driving them to, to go to the next level, you know, or even, you know, maybe one step up from where they're at. Or they fail. And I've seen that a lot. I've seen people that fail because they are building a business for the wrong reason. Yeah. And, I, and think about it this way. If you're building a business to get out of it, and someone else is building a business because they love building businesses, who's going to win? Yeah. It's right. The guy that loves it. Exactly. And so I think that that's the problem, um, you know, that people have is they're like, oh, well, I'm, I'm going to build this business just because I want to get out of it. Well, you're always going to be looking for the shortcuts and the quick money and yeah. you're going to fail because someone else is going to have passion for it and they're going to beat you. And so um, I think that that's an important thing to note when like a lot of people get kind of the, oh, well, I just want to build this. It's going to be, all you know rainbows and sunshine and then i'm going to exit and and my life's going to be so easy and i think that if you kind of expect that you're probably going to get beat out or or give up and and i I just something that i've been thinking about a lot lately yeah i think you're absolutely right like you know you talk you see these people that you know like a you know the the cliche person like michael jordan or something like that like that guy or you know kobe or something you know Mm -hmm, those guys Those guys ultimately were in a position that like they would wake up at four, go to bed at 12 and go, you know, practice for, you know, hours and hours on end. And like they didn't need to practice. They have like three rings or two rings. (laughs) And most of the guys are like, yeah, man, I'm going to go to, you know, I'm going to go party somewhere. And um, it's because the, you know, love of the game, there was no, there was nothing else that really backed them up. So, yeah, dude, you're um, absolutely right. If you're building a business to get out of it, um, you know, I mean, let's say, let's say this person makes, you know, makes a bit business to a hundred million. Maybe they, they ultimately could be, you know, a 500 million or a, you know, billion dollar business because they love it so much, but they, right. exit it, you know, short or shy of what their, you know, ultimate, um, abilities were. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, so, all right, let's talk about, uh, your rental portfolio and mm-hmm. kind of what that looks like as, as you, you know, 
as you yeah. build up this wholesaling and take more money and shove it in that? What does that look like and how long you built been building that for? Um, <clears throat> I would say seriously for about the last uh, two or three years, uh, because before that it was like, you know, single family, um, like duplex, like how tech type thing. Um, and so really it became uh, as like I, as I started building the wholesaling business more and uh, and then partnering with uh, David Perret, who I know um, I believe that you've connected with before uh, we yeah. started buying rentals in in Missouri. Um, you know, I mentioned earlier that uh, nothing's passive. And so we bought a uh, we, we started buying some just random like some single family houses that ended up really doing well for us. Uh, just picking up, you know, little portfolios of four and five properties. Um, and then we came across a rental portfolio uh, that was 40, um, 40 apartment units and then a, ho a hotel, which is a 40 unit uh, hotel. And so um, we picked up that and that has been uh, relatively passive. However, we we still have weekly meetings with our property manager on all of our, um, you know, on all of our our passive like rentals where we're, we're constantly looking at occupancy um we're constantly looking at the, at our cash flow statements and we didn't really need to do that last year um but i think like as as the market's shifting that's something that we are going to do but uh i have i i, I can't give you i'm the worst real estate investor ever man i don't know the exact uh number of units that i own or exactly the breakdown i just know it's like somewhere around uh 85 and um I would say majority of those are, are apartments. I want to say it's like a 28 unit apartment and a 14 unit apartment, okay. um, something like that. that was some single families spread in, um, you know, a couple duplexes. I don't have the exact breakdown, like nor I just know um, I'd be able to tell you like in a percentage, like what we're at occupancy wise. Uh, but as far as like how many exact units, I'm not, I'm not like one of those guys that like counts doors and like, I don't care about getting to a hundred units or anything like that um that i just know like the, all, all of my properties are located in one area and i do plan on keeping it that way for now i do like it that way being managed by one person yeah. because it does seem like the quickest way to be a passive you know to, to have passive income is one property manager managing all the books paying all of the mortgages um and and so that's the route that i'm going and, and i want to do more of that and that's why uh, i ended up actually buying uh David Prey's wholesaling business from him. Um, yeah, so I could explain a little bit about that. what that looks like. Yeah, so um, originally I was just California, Louisiana. Um, okay. I owned rental property in Louisiana, sold it. Uh, I started, we bought David Prey's company from him and, okay. um, and and are now taking over that to have some, uh, some more opportunities in Springfield. So long-term, especially over next year, I do plan on just stacking, uh, taking advantage of the, of the market and, and stacking, buying more apartments, buying more single families, and uh, building that semi-passive, almost passive income. <laughs> so, how was that conversation? And I, I didn't know uh, he exited that. So he was, yeah, um, he was doing it, and then he got over it, or you know, what, what was kind of that that conversation? Yeah. So, uh, in short, because a lot of people are like, "How do you sell a wholesale business? Like, yeah. what are you actually selling?" Um, <clears throat> so. Uh, we actually used to wholesale. I had uh, at one time I was doing way too many things and uh, I was, he, him and I were wholesaling together out in Missouri while I was wholesaling other deals in like California and Louisiana. Okay. And, uh, and then we, we really just started it because like, dude, let's go try to get some off market properties to buy. And um, mm -hmm. so we started it by doing that. And uh, he ended up, we ended up deciding, okay, we've both got too much going on. He wanted to go all in on it. He wanted to try it by himself. And I was like, all right, cool. I need to go focus on, on my mortgage business and my, my own wholesaling business. Yes. Um, he branched off. He hired a acquisitions manager, built it up. Um, and then at some point decided like his brand is huge. Right. And so yeah. um, he decided like that. He's like, that should be my focus. However, I've got all of this, all these things. Uh, so him and I are, are really good friends. So we talk on the phone all the time. I'm like, man, what is it that you want? He's like, I just want the deal flow. I want the opportunity. I was like, well, what if I gave you the opportunity of like a first right of refusal? Um, and then I gave you profit share, basically like just an equity split um, and mm -hmm. sort of a, a, a waterfall fashion. Um, so, I, and I 
I have to go back and look at the agreement, but um, oh yeah, no, you don't have to do that. But yeah, yeah, but the, the, I'll just say like it, it was a percentage of the of the actual um, of the net profit every year that that decreases year by year, and he okay. gets he gets first right of refusal on on um, any property that we lock up, so he gets it for our cost for marketing, and so um, he was like one of the few people that has have been able to successfully exit a wholesale business and it was one of those things that is just an absolute win-win he didn't like managing the sales team i love managing sales teams so like he didn't like dealing with the minutia i i loved the minutia he just wanted the opportunities to buy some off-market deals at a discount and i was like dude well, i can make that happen and i'll take over the business well what would you say um you i mean as a leader of a sales team what would you say that you excel at and also like i mean because yeah. that could be um you know anybody here listening where it's like mm -hmm. yeah i mean yeah it makes sense or no it's just a pain um right i mean it's it's a lot of work to be able to manage people that have expectations of either making you know, 150,000 a year, or, you know, they're good at 80,000. Mm -hmm. um, so you really got to manage all of that and in between that. Yeah, that's a really good point. And I think um, the first thing is setting the expectation as soon as the interviewing process is what do you want to make? And can I provide you a vehicle that will get you there? And so what I really like to find is people that you know they want to make more money they don't see the opportunity where they're at now and me seeing a clear path is if you just do the things that i'm going to teach you i can help you make a ton of money and you can help me take make a ton of money at the same time and so go ahead if you, it sounded like you had a question yeah i was just going to say where do you find these people so you got you know you're you're remote so right. where where are you finding these sales people that are like dude John, I want to work for you. I want to be able to, you know, make 150,000 or 100,000 a year and, mm -hmm. and I'm motivated to make more. Where do you find these people that you're, you know, you have all the online resources, but mm -hmm. you're not there in person. How are you doing this? Yeah. So, um, two of my, so my acquisitions manager, one of my, uh, agent direct acquisitions right now and my, um, and my disposition manager actually reach out to me, uh, and they, they were they were just one of them was off bigger pockets or something he's like hey i saw your information i'm looking for a mentor um i was like sure man i'll like i liked how hungry he was like i was like i'll i'll sit down i'll have lunch with you and help you out um and then he ended up coming and working for me um right. the other one I, I spoke at a real estate event in san diego um met another guy that was a similar story um and so you know i've had some talent come to me that way which i really like uh, but other than that i have a a a system built out for hiring salespeople. So um, I use Wise Hire. I have a VA that is going through, uh, as we speak, actually right now, going through and telling every single, I think there's like five, 600 applicants, um, hey, send me a video of why you think you'd be a good fit. So that's the first uh, shit test. And hopefully I can curse on this. Um, yeah, so good. like, okay, yeah. So send me a video of why you think this is a good fit. That's gonna eliminate a lot of people that just aren't serious, right? And then from there, uh, a quick interview and role play. She'll book them on my calendar. I give her access to, hey, you can book it at this time. And I'll just interview people. Um, and one of the things that I think I do different is I try to scare them away. And so if I can't scare them away, I want them to work for me. And so I'm going to tell them how hard it's going to be. I'm not going to I'm not going to fluff it up. I'm going to say, hey, this is the standard that I'm going to hold you to. I'm going to give you my all, but I'm going to hold you to this standard. This is how many calls you're going to make and you're going to actually say how many calls you've made in front of the entire company every Monday on our KPI calls. And so it just breeds a different culture. Yeah, for sure. I mean, why, why aren't you using, why wise hire? Yeah, I love wise hire because it syndicates to like all of the different platforms. Okay. Um, and so I've just, it's very simple. You post it, get a bunch of applications. It's got its own like little CRM inside of it. So uh, you know, people that it, it recommends based on your, it, you know, uh, personality, it does the disc profile inside of it, uh, which if you guys don't know, it's a personality test. And so uh, it has their resume uploaded. It makes it very easy for me uh, to, to go through. And then there's even a template uh, when I was doing this myself, which is like, hey, thanks for applying. Here's a Calendly link uh, that has my, you know, kind of similar to this podcast. Here's a Calendly link with a, a book it and then it automatically would send them a zoom link for the interview so it was almost it was very systematized uh the interviewing process i think you need to have it that way
Well, dude, I've tried, and I'm, I, I mean, <clears throat> I'll be frank, dude. I've tried. Uh, um, what's the other one? Uh, what's the main one? Indeed, and uh, oh yeah, and it hasn't been fruitful at all. Like usually, no. you know, you put these, and maybe you've experienced, but I put these like criteria, like deal breakers, and then these people mm-hmm. put in. And I've gone to basically now um, my sphere, kind of like real estate, where it's like, uh, I'll put these people, you know, these deal breakers in, and then they'll just say, yeah, I have my real estate license. I'll talk to them. And they're like, yeah, no, I don't have it. And I'm like, uh, yeah. So how do you get around that stuff where it's like they, they say they're qualified and then mm-hmm. ultimately they're not? I mean, I guess making that video would be that, right? Would be one, yeah. But I would say um, at the level that you're at, I mean, you had your assistant reach out to me to to schedule a podcast, right? Like, why yeah. why is your assistant not just having a quick five minute call just to weed out the crazies? Because I've also had like, and I used to get so frustrated. I I learned this from experience of failure, and I would you know block out thirty minutes on my calendar for an interview, only to have uh, you know an acquisitions manager uh, show up from India and can barely speak English. And it's trying to sell me a product on the freaking tech, <laughs> right? Yes. Like, like, yes. so like I, that doesn't happen or I've had crazies, like just like absolutely crazy people. And so I think you should have a gatekeeper um, for, for interviewing. And uh, even if it's just a five minute call, like, Hey, is this person normal? Uh, are they actually trying to apply it? And do they have the criteria? And so that would, that for you where you're at, man, I would 100% recommend doing that. And does your um, doing, you know, all your stuff on WiseHire, is it uh, compatible with wherever you're looking, right? Because right now, dude, you're looking, you know, uh, it doesn't really matter because you're remote. It doesn't really matter yeah. when they're remote, right? Uh, correct. I do have a um, lead manager right now that is in Nicaragua. Okay. However, uh, I use WiseHire for my U.S.-based employees. And so if I'm looking for uh, virtual assistance, I... I will always go with referrals. I feel like the mm-hmm. referrals have been the best because they know they're going to work. They know like, for example, I've got a cold caller in Egypt. If she knows, like, I'm like, Hey, you're going to be training this person. You're going to want to make sure that she, that she's good. Do you know anybody that you've worked with in the past? She's like, yeah, I've got five people. I used to manage a call center. Of course I've got people. And so I've gotten, I've gotten a lot of really good talent from uh, just asking for referrals. For yeah. PM. My, my thing with, uh, I've, I've gotten good referrals. My thing with VAs is usually what happens is um, either they get too bogged down because they, they say yes to so many different things um, mm-hmm. or they end up uh, doing some type of outsourcing like they're the headhunter and they'll, you know, they all of a sudden put someone in a place that ultimately you never hired and mm-hmm. they're like, you know, doing the work for you and their, their work is subpar. So that's, that's yeah. my only... Um, challenge with those i found a couple good ones through yeah. like trials and you know trials and tribulations of like okay this one's good no they're not good so yeah i would say that that would be a forewarning for people that are potentially looking for a va yeah and i could go i could go on a tangent about this but um i, I don't know if you know adam whitney uh he mm-hmm. said something to me uh he's a he's another wholesaler very successful wholesaler and he said something to me that stuck and it really changed my mindset he was like, stop calling them VAs. They're just employees in a different country. I was like, like I, I know I called them VAs, so it's not. But what he meant by that is you're, they're going to perform how you treat them. So if you treat them like they're like $5 an hour, they're going to perform $5 an hour. Mm-hmm. But you, need, you can pay them $5 an hour and treat them like they're you know, $40 an hour employees. And they're going to start acting like $40 an hour employees. And so I have found that to be true. A lot of it is like, how much are you man? Like you, if you, if you're managing them, you're, you're doing all the right things that a business owner should do. They actually can be very, very, very good. Like my marketing manager is in the Philippines and he does better work than a lot of us employees, like most. So, yeah, I, um, I'm taking notes here as we do this because wise is going to be like my next look as soon as we get off this podcast. Cause I've, uh, you know, I've struggled with hiring, um, you know, going back to the hiring process. So I always learn from, you know, guys like you and stuff like that to be able to mm-hmm. see what makes sense. But mm-hmm. um, yeah, dude, it's just, uh, it's tough because, you know, I've, I've, I've ran the, uh, the gamut of people that are good and bad. And, and obviously that's just the, the rules and the, you know, the road of being a business owner. But I'm glad that we jumped on this 
as yeah. like what's the kind of what you've seen. Um, and then also, you know, it puts them into a different mind frame, like you said, like not saying like, hey, they're VAs, they're, you know, um, employees that are making your business runs, you know, efficiently yeah. and systematically, right? right? Mm -hmm. so, exactly. Um, no, that that's huge, dude. That's uh, very helpful. And especially as, you know, people that are, are doing, you know, wholesaling or lending and you know i know lenders use vas and i know mm -hmm. real estate agents use vas so i think that you know that type of business um you want to be able to try to get out some of the stuff that you're really you know the ten dollar fifteen twenty dollar work you know twenty five dollar an hour work you want to be able to yeah. outsource that as much as possible so you can go do the hundred two hundred five hundred dollar an hour work for sure yeah um no, that's good. What what would you say um, is the best question to ask a person that's going to be a potential employee? Hmm. That one's going to make me think because it would really depend um, depend on the role. I think okay. I think the most like so I always look at uh, interviewing as as sales, and so I, this isn't going to be a one question thing. But what I want to find out is, you know, like when you're when you're looking to to help somebody in sales, you want to find out what problems do they have, and then what are they looking to solve, mm -hmm. and does your product or company solve those things? And so, I typically want to ask people about uh, what did they not like at their previous um, companies, like what what did they really not like. And the, oper the, the answers that I like is I wanted, I wanted more freedom. Uh, I wanted more freedom. I wanted more control and, and, and more potential to make money. So I'm like, okay, okay, cool. Like they were holding, your old company was holding you back. And I want someone that can make decisions and that wants the potential to grow because that means that I don't have to motivate them. I want people that are already motivated. So I, so I don't know if that's like a one question thing. I would kind of dig and figure out what role you have and ask them about what things they really didn't like about their other company. And, it, and if they're telling you, for example, a sales rep, it's like, yeah, I, I really didn't like that. I was capped at this sort of commission and I wasn't allowed to bring any ideas to the business um, about how we can get better leads or anything like that. And your company is, is something that there's no commission cap and you really want feedback from your acquisition manager, or sales team, or whatever about how you can expand the business. We're well, like, okay, perfect. This is the exact person I'm looking for. And so I think you know a lot of people cut it short, and they're just like, I'll interview five people and pick the best one. No, you have to interview. You don't call five leads and expect to get one deal. Like you have to call. It's a numbers. You have to call a lot. And yes. the, the more that you speak to, like you have to look at it that way. I don't. I don't even look at interviews in like numbers. I look at it in like how many months am I going to be having five interviews per, per week? You know what I mean? So, um, and then I don't even, I don't move forward until it, it really does feel right. Yeah, no, um, good. You know, I mean, I know that that's a dynamic question because it, it depends on the person and depends on the position. Um, mm -hmm. but I just kind of want to see, um, you know, it's a personality driven question. It's a personality driven, you know, situation where you got to say, okay, well, this is what you do. Um, yeah. so, so yeah, dude, um, I agree. I mean, I'm just uh, more amped up on talking about hiring because I got to hire more people. So. <laughs> I love it. Um, yeah, I love it. <laughs> yeah. Um, so let's see, dude, let's transition a little bit. Um, is there, I mean, since you're remote, I think this question would hit hard, but uh, yeah. what uh, online resource or app are you using that's helping your business be <laughs> more efficient? Yeah, it's so simple. I use, I use G Suite um, for everything. Oh. And so... Um, you know, like Google Drive, like everything's on Google. So I use the Google Chats. I put uh, little like workspaces for all the properties that we lock up. Um, so it'll be like a workspace for property address where uh, acquisitions and dispo is talking to each other. Um, I have a sales space. So every time a lead comes in, uh, you know, my my lead generators put in a lead. My lead manager sees it in, in the sales chat. Um, they create a MAO calc. They copy and paste the link to the MAO calc and the... Um, and the CRM. And that's always been the easiest because I mean, if you, if you have like a, a PDF or something that you, you know, you have to copy and paste in the, in the CRM, then it's very difficult to change, but other people have access to change it. So I know it's, it's so simple, but, um, dude, I use, I use G suite and like that's, that has actually been uh, really good for me 
uh, while being remote. I don't think I have like any, you know, I use a, I use a CRM. I use, I use like an SMS platform and, and call, call, calling platform, but I don't think I have any like secret sauce for being in uh, Colombia and traveling the world and uh, working remote other than, you know, <laughs> using like using the Google Drive and stuff like that for pictures, videos. And so I don't really feel like you need it. Yeah, you got, I mean, um, you got to be able to be remote and utilize, you know, your phone or jump on, you know, that that's where it saves you time, saves you energy. And, and, you know, if you can use the G suite, you know, you have, you know, Google sheets there, you have, you know, basically word documents, you can, you know, really add anything and have anybody have access to it for sure. Google, Google voice, uh, yes, Google all, voice. and all over the world. All of my employees have Google, all my VAs have Google voice numbers. So they call people like, uh, you know, they'll call a escrow company in California with a 949 yes. number. You know what I mean? So yeah, simple. yeah, that, that's huge because yeah, if you get some, you know, Bangladesh number coming in, you're like, I'm not answering this. So, exactly. Exactly. So that's huge for sure. Yeah. Um, yeah. hundred percent. So yeah, dude. Um, no, this has been this has been interesting. What what about a book that you've read? It doesn't have to be recently, just over the years that's really helped you. This one. So this is the Almanac of Naval Ravikant. And Dude, uh, I only have one. Yeah, he is. I love him. I only have one physical copy because uh, I also have my Kindle here. Um, I only have one book that I have a physical copy with me. Like I travel I travel very light. Um, and so but this is it. And I like I'll read this almost like a Bible. <laughs> like, you know, wake yeah. up in the morning, have my coffee, open it up and just look at some of the things I think. Um, I think what the and the reason being that I, I, I will say this book is it's really changed my way of thinking. I've always looked at business and, and everything in life is like, all right, how much money can I make in a year? Right. And I think when you when you think of things like that, you get stuck in these really bad opportunities, mm -hmm. opportunity vehicles that aren't actually serving you well in the future. So it, it shifts my thinking from how much money can I make in a year to what can I build in a decade? And I think when I started, well, you know, I, I didn't want to go too far into this, but when I, when I started thinking like this, it, it uh, made me really look at my business in a different light. And what am I focusing on? And can I do this over a long run? Because if I can't do it over 10 years, I'm going to get beat out by somebody that can. For and sure. so um, that kind of pulled me away. You know, that level of thinking pulled me away from, uh, I, you know, I was in the mortgage business before where it's like basically always a sprint to make as much money as possible in a year. Yes. And so, but like, you know, um, looking at 10 years from now, 20 years from now, I think it, it is pretty apparent that tech will start to take over that space. And so um, I'm looking for like different opportunity vehicles. Uh, so that, and just like general, general life practices, I think that the, the almanac and Naval Ravikant has been life-changing for me. What would you say? I mean, this is, um, not really on my list of questions, but what would you yeah. say after you say that you mm -hmm. see like, uh, especially cause you're in the wholesale business, um, mm -hmm. you see like, you know, open door and mm -hmm. Zillow stop buying. And because here's the thing is like, there's some predictions, wild predictions, five years ago, four years ago, three years ago. Uh, I'm not sure if you know, do you know Inman that, um, uh, like real estate article, it's like a magazine online. Um, sounds familiar, but I don't yeah, follow so, it. So like the guy that used to own it, he, um, he had people come in and buy it buy him out, but and he okay. sold the business, but he had a prediction like, uh, I buyers was, we're going to be 50% of the market. How do you feel about that? Hearing that, especially in, this now changing market where um, yeah. Redfin has put stuff on hold, open doors, losing like I've, I've shown so many open door properties or and or mm -hmm. my team has where, you know, it's been on the market and they bought it. Granted, they, they have a lot of fees that are, you know, margined in there, but they're losing money on a ton of a ton of properties and they've slowed down how to lay people off. Do you still feel like, OK, hey, in 10 years, mm -hmm it potentially could be a 50, you know, 15 or 20% market share of iBuyers. Um, what do you think? Yeah. So I haven't put a lot of, like, I haven't done a lot of research on the iBuyers like open door, um, Zillow or anything. So I'll just kind of give you my, what my opinion is, is I think that if you're looking at real estate at, for as a long term, like a lot of these, you know, hedge funds, look, they're just looking at, 
you know, a four or five, six percent appreciation. Um, I think there is an opportunity for high buyers to really take Wall Street money and dominate the market. And, you know, we would see a giant, even more of kind of a wealth shift um, if that ends up happening. So people are always going to go just basic human behavior. They're always going to go for the easiest route. And one of the mm-hmm. things I have speak, I was talking to a friend about this yesterday are the Gen Z generation. Like we're seeing it more and more. They're not wanting to talk to people. They really don't. And I, I don't know if you've ever dealt with this. Like I dealt with this in the mortgage industry. It's, it's more like millennial, like younger, younger kids that are looking to buy a house they don't want to talk to a sales rep. They want to just go and plug it. Like they feel more comfortable. Like, let me just like go plug in my information and then get like what my interest rate is. And then I can decide because I don't want to be tricked by like some sleazy salesperson and then to like buy in a higher, you know what I mean? They just, they just don't try. So uh, Jeremy Miner talks about this a lot. He's a really successful uh, sales trainer, which is we're in kind of the, the age of, of like mistrust. Uh, and I think with that, People are going to want us, they're going to start to lean more towards technology because they don't, they look at like anything where there is a salesperson, they're like, I'm going to get away from that. So I think like that, that, that would be my only opinion on, um, I do think that eventually people are going to start moving as, as some of the, right now we have a huge opportunity because we still have baby boomers that own homes that mm-hmm. don't know how to, they don't even know how to fill out their information on open door. If yeah. all you have to do is type in your address, yeah. <laughs> they make it pretty easy, but, yeah. um, I do think that, you know, 10, 20 years, yeah, I do. I, I could 100% see uh, things going completely digital. And even as, to be honest, I mean, even as, as easy as, hey, just upload pictures of your house on Zillow and somebody else can come in and put a bid in. Like, well, you know, when the sale date is, someone puts a bid in and that house sells, you know? So I think that a lot of that, you know, uh, people that have the sort of skills, uh, uh, you know, unless you have a really good skills of developing teams and developing a business, you're probably going to get eaten up by, by that eventually. It's just a matter of time. Yeah. I mean, well, and then that's, I mean, that, I guess that's another conversation for another, uh, um, I would say uh, podcast, but I think that that also puts us into a predicament of, you know, wholesaling being taken up because it's like, okay, well, yeah. I, I don't even, and same thing as real estate. And that's why I kind of posed the question because real estate agents have always been kind of under attack with like, Hey, you, you know, you don't, you don't create as much value as you know, ultimately, which I will say this, I mean, statistically, even with, uh, you know, Redfin open door and stuff like that, the, the stats have not really changed. It's still been very close to what it's always been on for sale by owners, you know, people only, you know, doing it themselves and stuff like that, because I feel like, you know, it's the same thing of like going to, you know, go buy a car. Like, um, there's a lot of things that are set into place and maybe, you know, maybe I'm looking at it differently, but, Mm -hmm. um, you know there's still some things that are in the unknown. Um, same thing as like an AC repair guy coming out, you know, those are, those are things that people may not know. Um, yeah. so, so just, you know, thoughts for sure. Um, yeah, absolutely. I like and maybe, question. and maybe just, you know, um, thinking about that and I'll get you back on the podcast to, to hash out, like being able to say, okay, well, where is, where is wholesaling the next, you know, 20 years? Because if these eye buyers come in, then it's kind of decimating, wholesaling, you know, flipping to, Mm -hmm. you know, lending and, um, and buyer and, you know, listing agents, because then all of a sudden, what, you know, what four or five categories are those good for? Right. I mean, yeah. And I do believe we're moving in that direction. Yeah. So, um, so what does that mean then just buy more rentals? Because here's the thing is, uh, since all these shops are closing up or not closing up, but, you know, laying people off, then you have like a chase that just came out a couple of days ago and said, they're going to buy up a billion dollars of real estate to rent out. So it's like, yeah, what? Yeah, exactly. So, and it means that you really do want to own real estate because it, it's going to be harder. Like every time, uh, Pineda talked about this, every time you sell to a, to a, a hedge fund, for example, you're not getting that house back. They just mm-hmm. package it up and sell it to other hedge funds. And so th- that is like that house is basically off the market permanently. It, you know, they're pr- pretty much not going to turn around and sell it back to, to a buyer. Um, and so I think how long can that go before it is 80% of the market share is owned by, you know, hedge funds and, and the, 
ultra wealthy and then they're just renting out to people from there. It could happen. No, for sure. It could. I mean, I think uh, I, I do think, yeah, there's going to be some changes in the market. I mean, you get, you know, Rocket Mortgage and all these other ones that are out there that are just taking market share, too. So you got to really realize at the end of the day, like, you know, there's, you know, every job's um, going to be replaced at some point. It just depends on when and how. And um, <laughs> and that's, you know, you know, it, that same thing is like you look at like uh, big companies, you know, Fortune 500, you know, Fortune 100 companies a long time ago, 100 years ago, a lot of them aren't here anymore, depending on, you know, what they were, you know, like yeah. the, the Kmarts of the world and stuff like that. Like yeah. The people that like really evolved, like the Walmarts and stuff like that, they had to do a lot of stuff to, to stay relevant. You know what yeah. I mean? Digital so, and yep. Yeah, digital, like they, they went on Amazon and then they pulled back from Amazon and started doing their own stuff online. So um, yeah. So, well, John, dude, I'll let you go, dude. I know you got a ton of stuff going on, but uh, I appreciate you jumping on, dude. And um, yeah, we'll um, we'll get you back on the podcast to kind of dive into those those other things that we talked about. Yeah, man. Thanks for having me. I really enjoyed the conversation. Yeah, for sure, man. Have a good day. Awesome, brother. You too. Thanks.